Edwards, who's the Associate Dean for Community Engagement and Professor of Health Sciences, Systems Science at the Kaiser Permanente Bernard J. Tyson School of Medicine. She will be presenting on addressing genetic conditions through a trustworthy community engagement lens. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you to all of the organizers. This is an amazing conference. I hope to come back because I'm not a geneticist, so I'm, I'm here to present as a community engagement specialist. But this is wonderful work that all of you are doing, and special thanks to Teresa for just waiting for me as a new dean and all the drama that I'm dealing with. No, it's not drama. It's just great, great work and moving back west where my parents are. Um, I'm really happy to be here, and my presentation is going to take a different spin. I'm going to really talk to you about why community engagement matters, which can matter in any, any facet of the work that we do, but it also matters in the genetic work that you do as well. I have no conflicts to disclose, and these objectives have been listed for you as part of your CME credits, but um, I'm going to probably talk more about trust and trustworthiness and um, just share with you what's in the literature on um, genetic counseling and community engagement, which is not a lot. There's genetic counseling and stakeholder engagement or patient engagement, but not a lot on community engagement. And I'll try to distinguish why that's important. And the example I'm going to give, I'm going to share it with you and we can talk about it as well. And I'll try to wrap, wrap up these slides. I'm not gonna go through all of them very quickly, very slowly. I'm going to go through some of them quickly, but I have these for you so that when you get the PDF, there's, it's more so of a resource for you. So I'm going to review the literature on genetic counseling and community engagement, trust and trustworthiness, and share with you the principles of community engagement which are changing right now. Those of us who contributed to that, uh, the document that's changing trustworthiness. Um, talk about familial hypercholesterolemia. I'm a cardiovascular social epidemiologist and a translational medicine scientist, so I usually use those kind of examples, but I want to talk with you because that's a specific population for the study that we're going to, I'm going to share with you, and then give you some conclusions and um, recommended strategies. So there's a lot of work that we know in terms of um, co genetic counseling and patient engagement. Many of these may be authors that you already know about. Um, Peter Lynn wrote this commentary on tel telegenetics, and it was wonderful to listen now to understand his point further about the necessity for us to really engage patients and many of the things that you shared in the um, telegenetics um, workshop. The re reciprocal um, engagement model of supervision, while it's about supervision and training the trainer on how to understand how to best communicate, the whole model of reciprocal, en uh, reciprocal engagement model should be one that also looks at how a patient can co-design the framing for the genetic communication that goes on. And this is where translational science really can play a role. Language concordance is all around patient engagement, explanatory modeling, clinical decision support, and familial genetic communication. All of these are, are in the literature, and they're pretty healthy and, and somewhat robust in the literature. But there's, very, there's less around genetic counseling and community engagement first paper I actually identified was by Mittman in 1998 with some of my colleagues. He quoted Braithwaite and Aaron Bua. This was a community empowerment model. So it's not just the patient. How do you involve the community so that they have the capacity to understand what genetics is and how they as a community will respond to supporting each other, but also how they can get the word out, share with organizations and the like. And so what he did in this um, paper, he just basically defined community empowerment and that it's access and control of resources. I'm now on this mission to say I can no longer just do research to practice. My work is now about going from practice to research. If I don't get to know the community, I cannot do this work. So I have now done capacity building work on COVID. And because I spent the time in doing practice-based work it has accelerated our opportunity to get many more grants. We work very fast because the legwork was done in the capacity building process. And that's what he's basically getting at. And the same thing for genetics and genetic counseling. 
And so secure entry into the community through gatekeepers, we all know about that. And we all know about the community advisory board. But it is a, it's a systematic thing that we don't talk about, nor do we define enough in the literature so that others can pragmatically figure out new ways to tailor how they're going to work within a community. Data stewardship is a major issue now. It's a major issue among our Native Americans. I'm on a national project with um, COVID with Duke and UNC right now, and our Native peoples are not very happy with how things are handled, but they work in a different governance structure. So we have to honor that governance structure, and it takes a much longer period of time. The others are basically migrant farm workers who are basically saying, well, what is, we, who's using the data? Who owns the data? How will it be used? And for genetics, it's critical for this because they don't trust the system as well. And with the stigma to some of the genetic testing and genetic outcomes, it makes it that much harder for geneticists to get the work done because the system is broken in its own way. And so it's a rippling effect. But I like this quote that it's the, the community is empowered to identify its own problems, develop its own intervention strategies, and form a decision-making coalition. We have to learn how to co-design with our communities. It is not easy work, but once you get started, you are able to sustain a relationship in a community to actually build and have the trust, which is one of the biggest pieces of what I'm going to talk about. The three other papers I'm going to mention are not, two are, two are not done in the United States, they're done in Africa, and the third is with the Native American population. But Mwaka and colleagues looked at the perspectives of return on individual genetic data. And the reason I bring this to your attention is because one of the themes that came out was community engagement and the consenting process. So if the patient doesn't trust and the community doesn't trust, it makes it that much harder. It means misinformation is constantly out there. And so you have to involve the community in the consenting process. How many of you have heard of the community IRB? You know what I'm talking about? You know about the community IRB, right? So we, we and, and, ha and you, uh, have you consented a group of people in your community IRB? But, and, and, and we basically have tried to take out all the legalese, say the same thing, and now they've built trust and they basically have more people participating in the study because we basically have done a community IRB. We'll talk about that. I'll try to find a resource for you because it's a wonderful way to basically consent communities as a group or individual without all the legalese. And community engagement is needed to determine community perceptions and individual preferences. So how we actually involve the community becomes really important because these cultural differences impact how the patients that you will see come to you at the table. The uh, Kenyemi um, and uh, colleagues article was about a neurobiobank and here they felt that the necessity was to enhance community understanding and here you see the word facilitate trust so that there was fair and equitable use of this biobank resource for research. And so we have to start thinking about how do we involve and not only talk about the pathologies and genetic information which we just heard about earlier, but how do we collect data and why does it matter? Case in point, I told you I'm a cardiovascular um, epidemiologist. I did a, a blood pressure study at church and it was really fun. I did this years ago. I was a really green behind the ears um, researcher. And I, the goal was to try to lower blood pressure by having a married couple come in and get training on nutrition. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner, had a nutritionist work with them and everything. And I was gonna collect some, um, I was gonna collect urine samples. One of the gentlemen did not want me to collect the urine sample. He's like, why is this necessary? And he was like, I'm not doing it. When I explained to him how he is a black male, we don't have enough data on him and why his information was important and had like basically a five or 10 minute conversation with him, he gave me a leader the next day. I share that story and it's funny, but when you think about it, if I had not communicated with him why it mattered and why he was valued, I would not have gotten any urine. But to get a leader from him because he then understood that he's part of the system, we have to have those kind of conversations with our, you know, with our patients, right? And this last one is what I told you about with the Native American communities, building a workforce of students trained in genetic counseling while reducing disparities. So this paper, the reason, um, and I searched for these and tried to find where they talked about community engagement, 
this was really about how do you reach the Native people who you have to work with the leadership, you have to work with the community if you're intending to involve any one person, let alone the community, in research. They speak as one body, so you can't just go to one individual. They will go back to the elders. So if you don't understand that, you go reach out. Guess what? You've now lost credibility, and now everybody else has to work that much harder to try to go back into that community to do genetic research. Trust is a psychological construct, okay? I'm going to talk about trust word, but trust is a psychological construct where it is the belief that relinquishing just some control over one or others won't lead to personal loss or harm. Anytime you're in a community, particularly communities of color or marginalized communities, the first question they want to know is when you're collecting data, are you going to do harm? Why do you want to actually know about this genetic testing? What will you do that doesn't make it harmful to me and to my community? And even sharing information can be considered harmful. So we have to be thinking about this. And so it is a psychological state. And the primary focus, when we see all the studies on trust, and my buddy is in here, um, Jarab Zave, who is going to show one of his papers. Um, we, if we study trust, trust is, leads, it, leads it to the, the participant to have carry the burden. If you're studying trust, you're basically saying, okay, they are the ones who have to demonstrate they trust me. So the burden's on them. Versus, and in this example here, if we don't have these commi committed partnerships, we don't have public trust. So while you have these other determinants of trust in academic partnerships, and this is Garab's paper, the key here that you see circled in um, red is it's only the committed partnerships that show this high level where public trust and research really, really matters out of all the constructs. So trustworthiness, on the other hand, is the antecedent to trust, and it is the competencies that you have to have. So we are the ones who are actually responsible. You have to demonstrate you're trustworthy before you can do tr have trust. So some of us are trying to actually start studying trustworthiness. The American, the American Association of Medical Colleges, AAMC, just put out um, principles of trustworthiness because we realize that we cannot talk about asking them to trust us if we don't start measuring that we are trustworthy. This last paper here, on tr this is the only paper I found on genetic counseling and trustworthiness by Keshmola and Perez and the, the key here that I want to bring to your attention is um, there are the benefits and the risks, but the factors that the counselors, the, the, the counseling factors were comfort with the technique, mastering of clinical skills, minimal knowledge of patients' emotions, session type, and counselor specialty was specific to the counselors. But what was specific to the patient, prior rapport with the counselor, emotional level, emotionality, and cultural background. So these things matter, and we don't do a very good job of measuring. That's why pe people like me, we're trying to figure out how to measure them. But they become really important in terms of genetic counseling. I'm going to skip these because these are references for you. I want to mention this example um, of familial hypercholesterolemia and genetic testing by Juan and colleagues. This is a good paper that basically says that the factors associated with getting genetic testing or our aversion to um, the testing, aversion to genetic information, excuse the typo, medical family history, curiosity, and psychological reassurance. And reassurance was the only variable that was a predictor of genetic testing intentions. This paper is a great paper. This is the primary uh, audience or the primary par participants were 83% prim um, white and 60% women. This is important information for any population, but if I'm trying to understand populations that are at great risk, they may not have the same opinion. We don't do enough of this study, and this is the only one that I was able to find. And so we have to figure out how do we identify the mediators to patient satisfaction or their, their reassurance and genetic counseling, the cultural factors, the social determinants of health. How do those mediate? even genetic counseling. I'm going to conclude with this really crude, this is so crude, you guys. I know I would tear it apart myself. Um, but at least it has the squares on there. I would probably draw some arrows and things. 
the main, the piece I want you to recognize is that community engagement needs to be a part of the model as well. We are, we do the genetic counseling through clinical engagement or patient engagement, but we don't spend a lot of time on community engagement. It's a tough business. There are those of us who have the skills and tools, not asking you to do it. We, we can help, uh, help those who don't know how to do this, how to do it. But it is important if we're going to understand how we're going to address individual level factors if we don't understand the community factors. And understanding those community environmental cultures actually help us not only identify individual um, level outcomes, but also community level outcomes. And so my conclusions here, wrapping it up very quickly, trust is a critical component. There's a robust body of literature on genetic counseling and patient engagement, but not on community engagement. The antecedent to trust is trustworthiness, and trust is a psychological state, but trustworthiness is a competency that we have to develop. And some of my recommendations are to refer the, to the community empowerment model. That paper was published back in 19, 1988, I think, 19, 1988. And the other papers that I just showed you were published in 2021. That means no one took this up and built a body of science after this paper was published 30 years earlier. We can start doing that. Consider building on the reciprocal engagement model with community input. Consult with experts in community engagement, right? Um, and community engaged research to develop tools and strategies. We have them. We would love to share these tools with you. Um, consider community forums to elucidate these cultural practices, assets, and challenges to develop effective um, community genetic education programs. There is literature on community education, genetic ed education, but do we do enough of it to actually tease out what is necessary to address those gaps and create more co-designed clinical research partners? I will send this to you. I have to make a correction in round of the references, but thank you so much for your time, and thanks for letting me speak so fast. <laughs>